Get it off! Get it off! Get it off! Get off me! This this feeling! I don't know what it is. I just I can't shake it. What is it? Oh, I know what it is. It's fun. I can't believe I'm gonna say this. Yeah, I know, right? I actually had fun watching Raw this week. Can you believe that? I actually had fun watching Raw. This is the most fun I've had watching Raw in I don't know how long. I just really enjoyed the show. Maybe some of you didn't like it. Maybe some of you didn't think it was that great. Maybe some of you thought it could have been a whole lot better. But just for some reason, I just really enjoyed this show a lot this week. Even more than the post-SummerSlam Night of Champions. From a pure enjoyment and fun standpoint, I, I got more of it this week. I know, believe it or not. I just... I'm just... Stunned. I, I don't know what to do. I don't even know how to really piece together this review. I mean, I'll look at it and I'll talk about a few things, I guess. I won't talk about everything because I don't want it to ruin my level of enjoyment of this week's show. So I'm just not really going to emphasize on the things I don't like. Um, so I'll talk more about the things that I did. I really like how Seth Rollins was utilized this week as the cowardly chicken shit type of heel. Yeah, to me, that's kind of overdone, and I don't think he's particularly good at it, and I really don't like how the WWE books guys only put him in that role, so it really doesn't help. It's going against the grain even more, and it just ultimately kind of flat, flat out sucks. That's why Seth Rollins' title reign hasn't been all that particularly good. But I love the way he was utilized throughout this entire show. You look at the very beginning. He's whining. He's bitching. It's... The odds are stacked against him, even though he's had the authority doing all this shit for him for a freaking year plus now. He's got both the WWE World Heavyweight Championship and the U.S. title, but he's sitting there and bitching about a statue. He wants his statue. And he's throwing a fit because he wants his freaking statue. And you can tell it's starting to get to him, the character, in terms of the comparisons to Triple H, and he doesn't measure up. You know, I really like how they're planting the seat for him and Triple H to square off shortly coming up. You know, I wish they would do it more so with Triple H playing the heel angle, but it's going to really come across as Triple H playing the babyface angle. And I just kind of think that's going against the grain a little bit, but it is what it is. But obviously, you when you had Sting show up at the very beginning, you knew something was going to happen with the statue. You knew there was going to be some type of payoff to this, and it, it was refreshing. You know, I talked about reason Sting should be the WWE World Heavyweight Champion, and in particular, I talked about one of the things is that his chase for the title, his pursuit of the title, could feel fresh and it could feel different. And here's an opportunity to use Sting and use him quite a bit while using him actually very little and at the same point time do something in a little bit of a fresh and different way for this current product anyways and really, really get a benefit from it. And I liked how Sting was utilized throughout the night. Uh, I thought that was done very, very well as well. Also in that opening segment, you know, when, when Rollins came out, I thought it was just going to be one of those typical authority Rollins type of promos, and I'm like, oh, fucking God. But it wasn't because of the way R Rollins was, because of what they did with Sting. And then even incorporating Sheamus. You know, Sheamus has really owned and grasped the fact that he does fucking look stupid, and he's using it to try and get some type of heat on him because God knows anything else they do with him doesn't get any heat on him whatsoever. So this is what you got. If this is what works, then that's what you got to go with. But I love how they're planting the seed of reminding you that Sheamus is the Money in the Bank winner and that he is a serious threat. And at any point in time, he could cash in maybe as soon as Knight of Champions. You know, you're, you're building off of the fact that Rollins has not one match, but two matches and could possibly have a third. Now, of course, they jobbed out Sheamus to Randy Orton later on in the show, but we can't get the moon when it comes to the Money in the Bank winner. And Randall Keith. Has to make sure he gets his pose on. It's just that simple. Um, but then I'd look at what happened with uh, Ambrose and Reigns. You know, go out there, squash the ascension. Fuck them, they don't matter at this point in time. Give us the little friendship thing, and then you know you're going to have Braun Strowman come out again, and all of this and all of that. And I like how they 
utilize these guys throughout the night too to try and take out somebody like let's say a Randy Orton, somebody that could be a potential partner for Ambrose and Reigns, and you start wiping out people, who does that leave for them? Now ultimately, don't get me wrong, this is all building up to what I would think, I would see, and I haven't read anything, I don't care, so I'm just floating it out there, but I'm pretty sure this is leading to a return of Mass Kane. You know, fire breathing, shooting out of his arse cane, and if that's the cane we get in a limited role, then that's just fine with me. And it would seem to somewhat make sense here. Now, when I look at Braun Strowman, I can't help but laugh. And the reason I can't help but laugh is he reminds me of my fucking Uncle Udo beefed up on steroids and stilts. That's exactly what I look at. I look at him and I see that weird fucking Uncle Udo and I say, what in the fuck is going on here? What in the hell? I'm like, holy shit. So that's what my uncle would have looked like a foot taller with steroids. Not saying that Braun Strowman's on steroids. You get what I'm saying. So the whole time I see Braun Strowman, I know he's supposed to be imposing and he's supposed to be menacing. And he's supposed to be physically dominant and he can choke out Ambrose and Reigns. The whole time I'm laughing my fucking ass off when I realize that he reminds me of my uncle. Udo FTW. <laughs> but uh, speaking of Seth Rollins, I really even love too how during the middle of shit, as things are going down, he's got a face off against Ryback. Again, you're building off of some problems with him and Stephanie and Triple H. I love how they incorporated Sting for the distraction. And Ryback, the IC champion, pins the world heavyweight champion. I'm fine with that. At least you're utilizing a distraction in a way that costs somebody a match. It should be more of a heel tactic, perhaps. But in this case, it works because it's Sting and because the heel is Seth Rollins. I thought that was really good. And then when he's coming storming back, the fucking New Day, these three dudes are making the most out of a dumb, bad situation. These guys are knocking shit out of the park. You got Biggie doing his thing. You got Kofi doing his thing. And Xavier Woods, by God, stealing the show with his fucking trombone. Trump, whatever, the trombone. Fucking incredible. And then the scene when you've got, they come up to Seth Rollins. <laughs> Seth Rollins, why? Why did I ask why? Why? And then here walks Edge and Christian. And you get that moment. And then Seth Rollins is like, I got, I got stuff to do. I got stuff on my mind. And here comes the Dudleys. And it was cool to see the Dudleys. And they got to put somebody through a freaking table with the Los Matadores. You know, so that's all fine and good. And you know, you're building up to those guys, the Dudleys, getting some type of tag title match at Night of Champions, whether it's against the New Day, whether it's against the Primetime Player. I don't give a fuck. I would assume at this point it would be the New Day. And I am down with that. God, that fucking segment was four minutes of awesome. Was Seth doing what he did? The New Day doing what they do? Edge and Christian, Christian pulling out the fucking kazoo, and then the Dudley boys? Just fucking gold. It felt like this week the WWE was at least trying to put forth a little bit of effort. They were trying to remind you that, hey, we know the football season starting this upcoming week, and here's some of you are going to be tempted to tune into Monday Night Football come next Monday. But we got the Dudley boys, and... We've got Sting pushing for the world title. It's like the 90s all over again, brother. The one thing I would ask, though, it's great that you have Edge and Christian make an appearance on the show since they're going to be on Stone Cold's podcast on the WWE Network. But here's my question. If you've got Stone Cold there and Stone Cold's in the vicinity, why not utilize him for a full-on segment? Why not? Does it need to make a whole lot of sense? No. Do you need to do a whole lot with him? No. It would just be a nice, pleasant surprise that you could just randomly throw into the fucking mix like you did when The Rock made that appearance with Rusev back when they were in Brooklyn. I think it was in October. I mean, that shit was incredible. You know, just send Austin out there for a fucking segment. Fill some time. If you're going to fill some time, fill some with one of the greatest characters in the history of professional wrestling, sports entertainment, and Stone Cold Steve Austin, I'm just saying. Now... Let me say this for the record. One thing I don't like is what they're doing with Dol Dolph Ziggler and Lana and Rusev and Summer Rae. And part of the whole reason I don't like this is because I don't see what the fucking point is. Because if they're just building to another Dolph Ziggler versus Rusev match, then why in the fuck are we even bothering involving Summer Rae and Lana to the point that we are where we're making it about the women if only the men are going to wrestle? 
Why are we not getting a mixed tag match out of this? Or why are we not getting Summer Rae versus Lana in a one-on-one -on -one match? Maybe you don't think Lana can go that well. Da, 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 da. Whatever. Then why are you building it up like this? Now, with that said, <clears throat> what they did with Dolph Ziggler and Summer Rae, for once, it actually worked. I was really starting to turn on this whole thing. And then when that happened, I'm like, fuck yeah, last week I'm in. Because Dolph Ziggler is singled out by a woman. He was minding his own fucking business. And he doesn't do a fucking thing wrong. And he gets himself in a shitload of trouble for doing nothing. And then when he's explaining the situation and telling the God's honest truth, because automatically he's a man, and as soon as we open our mouths, we're fucking lying. And those accusations coming from women of all people, imagine fucking that. Now Lana is talking about how that shit makes her feel. And blaming him and making it his fault. And automatically taking this bitch's side, who you've been arguing with, who you've been catfighting with for several fucking weeks. And you know when I sit there and see that, I'm like, bam, this is automatically my fat pen fucking dropping who gives a shit. One of the most realistic things I've seen on WWE television in quite some time. I don't need some fucking stiff fest of a WrestleMania men event, even though that feels real. I don't need this. I don't need work shoot from Holly Heyman. Give me this shit. This shit is believable. This is something that would happen in the real world because fellas know, just like me, that this shit happens on a day-in, day-out basis. You don't like that bitch. You don't trust that bitch. So, of course, when shit gets to get, you're going to trust that bitch over your dude. Anybody been there before? This guy. Yeah, I know I'm not the only one. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, great. Now here's a real opportunity to do something good with Dolph Ziggler. Lana's coming on him with this bullshit. You could either sit there and have him say, A, step off it, you know, something to this effect. Obviously, you can't use this language on a PG product. But basically, what the fuck is wrong with you? I'm Dolph Ziggler. Who the hell are you? Don't ever come at me with that shit again. Fuck off. And then, of course, maybe she would proceed to immediately suck Dave. Suck Dolph, whatever you want to call it. You know, that's believable. You know, dog them out, they'll love you forever. Or you could sit there and have Dolph say, yeah, you know what? I fucked her like crazy in the shower. I still got a cut juice on my dick. You want to taste it? Well, maybe, you know, Summer's curious. Lana, you're curious. You know, maybe we just make a three out of it. You know, again, another way that you can make Dolph Ziggler cool in this whole matter. But, of course, they make him the pussy whiny bitch, and they sit there and make him look bad by saying, Oh, my God, I'm going to make Lana feel bad. Man, fuck that shit! We don't need that reality. We don't need to see what guys usually do, which is us pussing out for the puss. Give us something different. Give us something to grasp onto. Make Dolph Ziggler fucking cool. Make Dolph Ziggler a dude's dude. Not an actual dude's dude, because he's just like the rest of fucking us, like I said, who we can talk all this good shit, but when it comes to it, we're pussies for the pussy. And we act like a bunch of punk, punk bitches, and we allow the women to have the powers of the vagine, and we know where it goes from there. And now this week, you do this whole apology, you know, just... Fucking A. Like I said, I'm with it when you're doing Lana's believing Summer Rae over Dolph. Even though she's been cat fighting with Summer Rae for weeks, she doesn't like Summer Rae, doesn't trust Summer Rae, because that is something I could believe that women would do, because that is exactly what the fuck they do do. They would trust their enemy over their friend. <laughs> they would trust their most bitter rival over the person that they love. I'm just saying. I just wish I would have done something different. At least they did something a little bit different here with the Divas Division. They should have started this Bella countdown clock a lot sooner and given it more time and built up more heat on it. If you were just going to fill time with Nikki Bella and her title reign until she passed AJ Lee and assuming that she's not going to draft the strap next Monday on Raw, it would seem like it would fucking be pointless at that point other than to sit there and say, you never know what's going to fucking happen if you watch the show. You know, you could have gotten a couple months worth of heat out of this to build up to that point where somebody like Charlotte or Sasha Banks did come in and beat her. You're like, oh, wow, yeah. Now you kind of throw it in at the last minute like you realized it's one week away. You know, I, I just, I wish they would have done more with it, but at least they gave the Divas multiple segments on the show again, but at least one of them was an actual talk segment before they got to something actually happened in terms of these slapping in with the Stakoffs. And then we get to the end of the show. You know what was good about this week's show? 
is that there was barely any John Cena. He just basically there shows up for the main event to AA Kofi win and leave. And okay. The one concern I have about this, though, is that the way they're positioning it, if you notice when they're pumping it up during Raw, is they're treating it like Sting is facing off with Seth Rollins for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. And then Seth Rollins is defending against John Cena, which makes it seem like Seth Rollins versus John Cena is the main event of Night of Champions, which is ridiculous, which is insane. And if WWE actually went down that route, then they deserve to have the shit smacked out of them, period. That is stupid. Absolutely stupid. If you're going to do that, then just make it a triple threat where both titles are on the line, or have it be Cena is the semi-main event against Seth Rollins, and then immediately Seth Rollins has got to face off with Sting. That way, at least you could excuse him losing to Sting because he already had Russell fucking Cena. Superman is out. But you're building it up as, you know, Seth Rollins' real test is John Cena, even though everything you're doing is with Sting. Everything that is interesting is involving Sting. The feud that you care about, the feud that matters to you is Sting. And I just don't really like the way they're kind of poking it in. I'm sure some of you may have picked up on this, or now that I mention it, will kind of get what I'm saying. That concerns me a little bit. And this is one of the concerns I have, too. It's not to say that Seth Rollins isn't a talented enough individual to pull off two feuds at the same time with two different guys like John Cena versus St and Sting. The problem is, is I don't think the WWE can write for one guy having to carry two feuds at the same time. I just don't. Now, when I see somebody like Kevin Owens perhaps going after Ryback in the IC title, sign me up! I'm in! But Rollins feuding with both Cena and Sting at the same time? Eh, Cena either gets left out or Sting kind of gets left out. The emphasis and focus needs to be on Sting more as it should, and at least the WWE has put it there. But, you know, the, you've got Rollins having to face off against Cena. It just, you know, it can lead to too much exposure of Rollins, even though there was a lot of exposure of him this week. I thought it was done in a good way. I thought they could have incorporated Cena a little bit more than kind of just taking the lazy route of having him win the, the six-man tag main event. That was my thoughts. But then after that match, then you've got Sting's big revelation. Lights come on. There's a statue. There's the garbage truck. And you know where the shit's going from there. And I sat there, and as this is going on, I'm like, I know how this is going to go, but I don't care. I'm enjoying the shit hell out of this. This is why I was so in favor of Sting pursuing the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. This is why I want Sting to win the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Because it is a jolt in the arm. It is something fresh. It's something that is making this product it's somewhat enjoyable and a little bit more fun. And it's helping put other pieces into their place, especially when you sprinkle in the Dudley Boys. You've got the New Day kicking ass, doing what they do. You know, Ryback versus Kevin and Kevin Owens, please. You know, the whole shit of Big Show hitting a knockout punch on Cesaro because he couldn't get to The Miz. Now, again, I'm not really a fan of that either. But like I said, with this week's show, I just enjoyed it a lot. There was enough sprinkled in throughout that really made this enjoyable. I thought Seth Rollins was really good this week. I thought with some of the big segments, honestly, the WWE delivered, which is something I really haven't been able to say for quite a period of time now. They pretty much executed and delivered with every big segment that they needed to. And I was impressed, at least for this week. Now, we'll see if they can follow up on this and give me another really fun show this week. But it was nice for one week to not have a whole lot to nitpick about. It was nice for one week to just sit back and have some fun and just be a wrestling fan again.